Hello, welcome back to the Deep Dive Discography. It is I, Marcus Arar. Joined with me, as always, is Mr. Aaron Price. Hello, Mr. Aaron Price. What is up, Mr. Marcus Arar? Um, we're having a bit of a revolutionary day today. Revolutionary. We're going to talk yeah, about I mean, a radical band, aren't we? Rad. Rad AF. The most radical band perhaps ever in the history of radical bands rage oh, against the machine uh, label society oh fuck yeah shit i listened to the wrong band yeah yeah do, ooh, oh whoops sorry oh well i mean it is what it is too late now too late now um don't do your homework it's fine it's fine it's how yeah, we roll yeah, it does homework. we're gonna talk about them we're also gonna talk about uh province of rage yeah because that's also a band that is associated with this band. Yeah, not a very good band, but a band nonetheless. Spoilers! And yeah, that's not that much of a spoiler, really. <laughs> Spoilers. I don't think anyone was ever wondering if that band was any good, but you know, we're going to talk about it as if there was any suspense. As if yeah. we all don't have opinions on this band already. Nope. No, but they're, I mean, they are a pretty unknown band. Obscure. They, def, they definitely don't charge hundreds upon hundreds of dollars to to buy tickets. Yeah. Real bummer, dude. I really want to go see this band play, but uh, wasn't down to spend $200. That's like a plane ticket to a lot of yeah. places nearby, so I was kind of... I got hesitant. lucky that I can use the excuse that they canceled their UK and European tour. Yeah. No, that's that's definitely the whole reason I didn't go. Some of us didn't get so lucky. Actually, that was supposed to be today. I think Run the Jewels are still here today, but oh, that's cool. Eh. Yeah, yeah, like Run the Jewels is really good. I I like them. I just um, you know, opening for Rage yeah. Against the Machines way more of a selling point for me than their own headlining performance. Yeah, but before we go any further, this episode is brought to you by Rage Shadow Legends. Just kidding. Mm -hmm. It's it's not at all. I wish it was. Yeah, should we should we try and get a Raid Shadow Legends sponsorship? Oh yeah, yeah. That's like a rite of passage. Same with like Blue Apron, Sealy Mattress, um, Harry's Razors. We might have one coming from G Fuel. Oh my fucking god, <laughs> yes. That is so dude, get them the get, I'll give you my address. Send me all of that. No. I'll drink so much G Fuel on camera. I'm literally j drinking G Fuel on camera, so I'm ahead of you. Get fucked. Really? Show me your drink. Uh, it's right here. One sec. Right, right there. It's I got a boys cup. Oh my god. Are we hashtag sponsored? No. No, this this is completely hashtag unsponsored. <laughs> wow! Look at that slurp. My god. It's it is delicious. We this one is this one's lemon lime. Is it tasty? It is. We uh we apologize for our absence. Aaron had to go fight in the Ukraine yet again, so we uh are very happy for a safe voyage home. Yeah, man. You know, life happens. Yeah. He's remarkably yeah. not suffering from PTSD, so he decided to do a podcast with us. Or I am, and that's why I want to do the podcast. That's right. That's right. Um Hell yeah. Rage Against the Machine, self titled album. Pretty good. Yep. <laughs> Pretty it, great it, album. It is. I mean, obviously, I wasn't alive when this came out, but uh, I can only imagine the kind of reaction that that album cover would get in the early 90s. Yeah. No, absolutely. It must have been very, very shocking. The 90s were a very, very weird time where things were very offensive, seemingly for no reason. Um Especially a band, too, that's, like, so outwardly political. Such a major, yeah. major band that just actually had Look, something to say. But also think about it. Nobody knew them at the time. Yeah. So, like, nobody really could have known that they were political. <laughs> so it's just, like, in, until you actually listen to it, you don't really know. Yeah. I guess the, the, the fucking name of the band. That's, that's the word, his name. Name of the band would kind of give it away a little bit, but you, you know. think so? I uh, see, we have all seen that meme that went around where people are misunderstanding that Rage Against the Machines is a political band. I wonder 
if there are people who walk among us who do actually just not think about things deeply and just somehow miss this band as political, but weirder things have happened, I suppose. So, yeah, yeah, weirder things have definitely happened. But you'd also have to be pretty dense not to like listen to like this loud, angry rap about the government and just like not understand what it's about but i guess if you're really really dense you might interpret rage against the machine as just being anti-authority but that's not really the point yeah that's a very superficial like if if you're angry at the government i suppose you're anti-authority but i think a better way of putting it's anti-authoritarianism yeah anti-colonialist yeah. and you know those kind of like values yeah a lot of stuff that kind of goes into it um, uh, from various spectrums, but yeah, it's it is it is really hard to kind of miss miss the point. Um, I will say the biggest issue I had with this band, hey, it took me a long time to ever actually get into them because I always had an issue with how repetitive the lyrics are. Like on this album or just in general? In general. And okay. Like, well, okay, specifically their their popular songs. Right. You know, Killing in the Name of, Testify, uh, Bulls on Parade, they're all very repetitive songs. But in hindsight, and looking back on my thoughts on that, um, I kind of get why. Mm-hmm. If you if you keep if you say something enough, people will fucking understand what you're talking about. Yeah, it's very memorable. Very uh, Zach LaRoche, he's very good with like writing very catchy anthems, right? Yeah, yeah, they are definitely catchy, and obviously that is kind of the whole point. There, it's just it's catchy. It's it's something that will stick in your head, and that that's that's it. Like if it doesn't stick in your head, then how are you supposed to really? care how are you supposed to understand the message if it doesn't if it's if it's not in in there in in the mind is that's the cool thing about this band though is that their lyrics are very very political but Zach de la rocha makes it a lot more digestible by having those kind of like anthemic courses and stuff like that yeah like you know the way the way i'm gonna put it isn't really right but he kind of just like he dumbs it down for the average person yeah sure and, and that's of, not to say that, that the way he writes is stupid, obviously. Some of the lyrics he writes definitely touch upon historical events that a lot of us might not be totally familiar with. Like, if I, I could be getting this wrong, but Zach De La Roche, correct me if I'm wrong, he is Cuban, is that right? <laughs> okay, I, I know he's Latin, so his political issues might not be on all of our radars unless you're really into like the history of some of those countries and like you know communist governments and stuff like that like uh when i read the lyrics i'm not exactly sure totally what he's referencing a lot of the time only because those are historical events aren't relevant to my upbringing and like my culture right but um, the message yeah. is clear even if you're not totally familiar with what event he might be referencing yeah, I mean, a lot of the things as well, like, he he does reference a lot of things in, in total. He he is of hi Irish heritage as well, um, which is obviously, like, why there's basically an IRA album cover for this album. Mm -hmm. It, But uh, I, I think one of the biggest things when it comes to touching on historical things, even through the like America is the fact that America has this th this God complex that they do no wrong and, and all that kind of stuff so a lot of the stuff that they do actually do wrong they don't teach right. or they bend it to you know make them seem better so a real quick correction on my part Mexican American that's uh, Zach's background. I just want to get that out of the way real quick. Anyways, um, yeah, I think that's a huge part of, you know, why his lyrics are the way they are because the American education system 
very much does like to whitewash their history, kind of like make it seem like, no, 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 we were the good guys. Everyone else was the antagonist. Don't think that deeply about it. And I think um, as far as like a mainstream version of this message, this might be one of the earlier ones. Like obviously that's been a thing for a while. Like, you know, black activists in the States have talked about that a lot. Where like history is improperly taught and, you know, they, they called out the the responsibility of the government but on a more mainstream musical level besides like black artists this is kind of a kind of a new one right especially in the metal world the metal world doesn't really get political in that regard the medical political message of like the 80s and 90s was like anti-authority but again not anti-authoritarian do you know what i yeah. mean like the, by that distinction yeah um if you think about like thrash metal you know, that predates Rage Against the Machine. What was their political message? That, like, oh, like, war is bad, politicians lie. Okay. Yeah, basically. Okay, great. It's, yeah. it's a good place to start, I suppose, but uh, it's very surface level. <laughs> we, we we all knew this. Thank you. Yeah, but um, the, then as it would turn out, a lot of the thrash guys ended up just being, like, weird libertarian dudes. So their version of that argument <laughs> was kind of fucked up anyway. So, you know. I.e. Megadeth, right? Like, yeah, Megadeth's political, but they're very political in the sense that, like, they're a very good bumper sticker. Yeah. But it's the amount of depth of, like, a kiddie pool, you know? <laughs> Whereas Rage Against yeah. the Machine, that's way more about, like, actual revolutionary, like, talking about, like, wealth distribution and education system and about, like, homeless people and stuff like that and, like, you know, way, way deeper topics. Yeah. Yeah, there, there's definitely a lot more that goes into it than than most bands, most metal bands at the time. And like you said, the even even then, when when it is talked about, it is very much from the the black point of view, where it's yeah, it it's w not weird, but like it's very different to see someone white standing up for rights of just everyone it's not common way more no. common now of course as, yeah um, a lot of people will happily point out whenever we talk about this stuff <laughs> but yeah especially back then again all this activism was coming from mostly black artists really uh, yeah. white people in the 90s could not be bothered yeah, white <laughs> to people. talk about this stuff and take the heat for it because people uh get very very upset when you say that the country they live on might have has some unfortunate history. Uh, it might actually suck, kind of suck. How dare you, you fuck? Uh, I don't know. I'm not from America, so that makes me racist. How dare you point out that my country doesn't always provide for its citizens, you fucking asshole. <laughs> and also, before anyone decides to yell about that, I understand that saying America's not a good country is not racist, but that's exactly what people would claim. Yeah specifically Americans who think that everything is racist even though xenophobia exists and they're scared of that word ironically yeah Americans uh, do not like talking about race particularly white ones yeah but also Canada we have our own version of that yeah uh, every country does it's not do. it's not to say that America is the only country that's kind of fucked up it's just the most vocal about being fucked up Yes, <laughs> that's a very good way of putting it. And so, as Rage Against the Machine is also a band that has music in their music. Um, lyrics aside, instrumentally, this album is fucking kick ass. Yeah, there's a lot going on in this album. Um, uh, I'm not sure how much thought I gave Rage Against the Machine prior to deciding to do this episode, but uh, it's it's definitely it was definitely a lot of fun to go through. Yeah. I uh, I didn't think that deeply about it until I got to around like um, Renegades of Funk. I had to put my <laughs> I had to put my thinking cap on. We'll get there when we do. Here's the thing about the instrumentation on this album: um, it kicks ass. The production's tight, which makes everything sound really, really huge, very clear. Really interesting mix of styles going on here. I'm um I'm not a th funk metal fan. I think that's a safe assumption for most people, quite honestly. Like, funk metal is kind of a flawed genre with very few standout artists. I don't even know if calling Rage Against the Machine funk metal is totally accurate, but 
for our intents and purposes. Sure. Right. (laughs) Um, yeah, I think it's really amazing how the hip hop blends seamlessly over top of the rock elements, because that's a hard, really hard balance, man. I I think a lot of bands to this day struggle with, I, I don't think rap metal is something that should be attempted to often. Um, a lot of bad bands that incorporate that and even newer bands like stray from the path that are basically like diet rage against the machine right it's it never hits the same because quite frankly most people can't fucking rap rap is very very hard to make sound cool a lot of people can talk rhythmically but a lot of people cannot rap and shed bars yeah zach de la roach has fucking bars on bars on bars on bars on bars and that's why rage against the machine is sick and that's why other bands that rap fucking suck and even rap like i'm a rap fan i like hip-hop a lot a lot of bad rappers man a lot of bad rappers and this Um, band is very much the whole package as far as what i like about hip-hop like really really strong backing tracks or instrumentation if you will mixed with heavy ass bars that just go super aggressive aggro um what's the word for it? delivery on the lines everything is sold everything's punchy there's punch lines when it needs to be it's fucking sick and i say punch lines not comedically but he knows how to like summarize his thoughts and you know really like, hit the point yeah yeah and, and hit the point hard and really force it into your mind but um no, I, th- I think one of the most interesting things about Rage Against the Machine that, that does need to be said is how much it does really blend the, the metal, rock, and rap communities. Yeah. Like, so many of these communities who would generally never cross over are all very into Rage Against the Machine. Yeah, it's amazing because... Um... Even rock and metal don't particularly mingle amongst each other that often these days. And it's like, it was amazing that this band's a really good crossover. And, you know, rock especially does not play nice of rap. I feel like metal, there's this weird kind of retconning where now metalheads think it's kind of okay to like, oh, I mean, it's always been okay, but now it's kind of like more cool for metalheads to like hip hop. Like other genres? Yeah, that's, that's a bit more of a thing now. Yeah. Which I hate. I hate that that's now a thing. Like, why Why are yeah. you just figuring this shit out now? Took a long time, man. Took a long time. Well, metal's no longer edgy. It's true. It's not counterculture the, anymore, so, you know. Now the edgy thing is to like multiple genres. That's edgy. Now that's fucking edgy, man. Yeah, if you want to listen to edgy music, you kind of got to find, like, trap metal and, like, I don't know, like, what is edgy music anymore? This was edgy music in the 90s. It's not it edgy really by was. today's standard. I mean, I guess it no. is still edgy because it still makes people pissed. Yeah, like, and it like it makes people uncomfortable as well because it is it is an uncomfortable conversation to have that, you know, our governments are not fucking great most of the time. There's a lot of bad stuff going on in the world, so it's even to this day it's still doing the exact job that it set out to do. But you know what it is too. It's like this is edgy. For people who think who have shitty opinions, and that's why it's an uncomfortable conversation, right? Like, yeah. this is a really good litmus test for your friends <laughs> is to like put on oh, yeah. as the machine and just see what they say and say, "Oh yeah, I like them," or "No, I hate them," and what reasons they drop, right? Yeah, exactly. My <laughs> my whole reason for not liking Rage Against the Machine was just I thought it was very repetitive. Yeah, yeah, I, I absolutely always agreed with their message, but it's just. I'm not a very uh, the, the repetition always threw me off, but yeah, I could I could see some people just don't like rap music, just like not getting done yeah. with this stuff. But um, yeah, like if you just if you're just not into the actual music and you're for or understand what it's about, that's a different story. But yeah, so people are like, oh, I don't like how political they are. It's like no, you just don't like the message that they have to say. Yeah, I just want to get this off my chest so no one ever comments on our video ever again saying some half-baked, shitty, fucking stupid political opinion. Everything is political (laughs) because the world is political. Everything you do is a result of politics. Art has always been political. We've been through this in the 60s. This is nothing new. Jazz was political. (laughs) 
like this is this has been a thing even classical music is technically political because it was music sanctioned by the church paid for by the church so yes bach <laughs> made music because the politics influenced him and paid him because church and state were tied together so music has always been political get over it <laughs> don't be a baby but they're not tied together anymore right no, right? no. Uh, wait, wait a minute. <laughs> you almost got me for a second. I was like, oh, no, yeah, right, not anymore. Yeah. Yeah, good fucking joke. Yeah, so um, you know what I like about this album? Uh, the guitar solo is shred. And this yeah. is actually before Tom Morello fully went into like his whole guitar effects thing. He plays yeah, more like... straight up shred licks on this album yeah. compared to other releases where it's way more like. I guess, like, I don't know, like, DJ sound effects on his guitar. Yeah, like, when you get later into Rage Against Machine, it's like, man, what are you doing? And, like, that, I, you know, again, it's it's one of those things that you can kind of see, like, not people not getting into. I but see yeah, I mean, why people think this is their best album. Or I feel the general consensus tends to be. It's pretty focused. Um, it I is find very focused later releases particularly renegades and battle for los angeles are actually a little less focused i uh don't know if this is my favorite rage against the machine album but i mean like i'm definitely not going to contest it you know what i mean yeah. i think it's fucking brilliant um every song on here is pretty much a hit yeah it, it is a very good album that's for sure front and to it, back like even the lesser yeah. known songs are still like I don't know if I'd call them favorites, but like Take the Power Back wasn't a single, but a lot of people seem to like that song a lot. Fistful of Steel, people like, you know. Township Rebellion's a really heavy song that I actually kind of forgot existed until I went back into this uh, album here. Into this here album here? This into this here, them, their musical collection. Endeavor. Yeah, music's weird, yeah. man. Just sounds yeah. over time. Yeah, no, it's a good album. It's uh, it's it's cohesive. It it does exactly what it wants to do front to back. Um, the singles are obviously incredibly well known, but everything besides the singles is also out. Yeah, out. All right, I read Inside Out. Is also good. It's also great. Yeah, I read Inside Out. One of uh, Zach's other bands. <laughs> yeah, Inside Out's my great. By the way, brain. if you're a hardcore guy. It's, uh... Yeah. It's, I mean, it's dated, but it's it's really cool. Like, obviously, it's an 80s-ass hardcore, but it was really sick. All that aside, yeah, I think this album um, might be one of the strongest debut albums, like, of any band ever, especially that we've talked about, that's for sure. I, uh, yeah, no, I, I, I've, I don't know. We, we talked about Pantera last, so. Yeah, well, I mean, that that's our litmus test is like, uh, <laughs> like, their this debut is... album. This is, weirdly enough, the exact opposite of Pantera. Yeah, this is literally the polar opposite of Pantera. <laughs> this is... Pantera is not racist. Are they political? There was, just one, there, there was just one drunk issue, and uh, you know, you, you gotta, you, why are you hating on Pantera for, for doing one stupid thing? No, I'm pretty sure it was a couple stupid things, wasn't it? <laughs> like, there was be a rude, lot of stupid like... things. Yeah, dude. Uh, is Pantera yeah. political? Probably. No. I mean, literally, yes. But yeah, I mean, throwing Nazi salutes is literally political. That is pretty political. Yeah, I guess a Confederate <laughs> flag is a political symbol, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it is. Oh it's, shit! It's well, not a, fuck, it's my really bad. not a good one. <laughs> my bad, I guess. I didn't realize. <laughs> certainly not a fucking good one. Oh fuck, dude! That is like America's version of the fucking Nazi flag. Yeah, it kind of is, isn't it? Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I like this album a lot. You should listen to Me it. Me too. Unless you're yeah. faint of heart. Yeah, you should... unless you're scared of people talking about the fact that the world isn't great. Yeah. Hey, man, Evil Empire. I like Evil Empire quite a bit. Uh, This was my first experience with Rage Against the Machine. Do you know oh, why? Really? Why? Bulls on Parade was on Guitar Hero 3. Yeah, Bulls on Parade's a really good song. And it was a lot of fun to play on Guitar Hero 3. Yeah, what a 
What an awesome set list this thing is, too. You got People of the Sun as the opening track, Bulls on Parade, and you got Vietnam. I really like that. Those, like, first three tracks really set the stage for this one. This yeah, one gets a Down little... Down Rodeo is great. Down Rodeo is really sick. I think this album gets a little bit more into uh, Tom Morello guitarisms. Oh, the, yeah, it does. The version of Tom Morello that we reference when we talk about Tom Morello playing probably is in reference to this. Yeah, I think I think more than anything is definitely this album. This is way more of a straight up rap album too, which I kind of like. It's the reason I say that is because the guitar effects, like Tom Morello, is basically playing just like all funk and groove metal riffs on that first album. This one's just like he's trying to make like tracks. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, it is definitely a lot less like rock and roll somebody's gonna watch the fucking video for this and think i've just been doing coke or something my nose is itchy as shit and it has been like this whole time i am i am very anti-drugs for anyone who thinks i've been sitting here snorting off camera i, I don't um, do drugs either <laughs> drugs aren't cool drugs are bad okay yeah yeah no it's i i totally get what you mean that's more of a rap album like it is still a very like rap metal album rap rock album but yeah tom morello and his guitar effects and all that kind of stuff is uh it it does give it more of like a dj uh just a backing track type of rap feel than it does a yeah. having a band behind you yeah that's like that's kind of the big difference between these first two albums really is just like do you want more of the riffs or do you want more of the aesthetic because this album is way more aesthetic and it's a lot darker. That's what I kind of realized. Uh, the first album is a lot more fun, which is pretty funny to say, but considering the album cover is literally a dude setting himself on fire at a protest. But um, yeah. the album sounds a lot more fun. It's way more up, way more funk influence. This one's way more hip hop, so it's a lot darker kind of sounds and stuff. And like you know, yeah, hip hop was getting pretty heavy in this time and place, right? So. Yeah, because even Bulls on Parade, which is obviously like a fucking huge song for them, it's it's nowhere near as like, like here's the thing, Killing in the Name. You, I'm gonna use your favorite analogy. You can turn on at a party, and people yeah. will be down for it. Yeah, man. You, even Bulls on Parade, which is probably like the most uppity song on this album, you can't. Yeah, it, it's pushing it. Yeah. <laughs> like if you if you want the party to end, you could probably put on just Vietnam and just <laughs> just let it happen. Ah, that's what I will do from now on. Yeah, if you want the party if you want the party to go home, just start putting on like actually you know what? Just just go full edge lord, just put on Prophets of Rage and just let the party That's just clear mean out. though. Yeah, it is, that's pretty cruel, yeah. Yeah. Um yeah. I, I like how <laughs> dark this album is i i kind of forgot that's this is what it was though when i went back to it what is the uh what's the album cover all about do you know um i'm actually have no idea i was wondering if you knew the story behind that no i i know significantly less about this band than you do you know what that's fair enough um the Let's cover of the album the actually internet will well actually in fact i can tell you right now the cover of the album features an altered version of a painting from the 1940s comic book hero Crime Buster, done by Well Ramos. Well Ramos? Mel Ramos. <laughs> Words are hard. So there you go. It is. I did not the know that's what the album cover. The booklet includes a picture of, of a pile of various political and philosophical books. Hmm. Which includes Howard Zinn, Karl Marx, James Joyce... Timothy Newton, Franz Fanon. Yeah, there's a lot of people here who most people probably don't know. Yeah, Johnny yeah. God's Dad, I don't Trumbo. I know who Trumbo pretty. is. Do you know who Trumbo is? I know who Trumbo is. Yeah. For those who don't know, Trumbo was a Hollywood screenwriter who, um, during the Red Scare of, I think it was the 40s or the 50s, um, he uh, was essentially a socialist and Hollywood went through a huge witch hunt and pressured a lot of actors and directors to out their communist friends and uh yeah it was a thing did you know that he likes to write in the bathtub i did know that yeah yeah 
Do you know where I learned that? Probably the movie. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh. Modern Family. Ah, oh, interesting. Yeah. <laughs> so what's interesting about this title is is a reference to a Ronald Reagan speech. Evil Empire was in reference yeah. to what he called the Soviet Union. I could see why they would use that as an album title because of the irony that it draws that like, oh, isn't it funny that like America is calling other countries an evil empire? Isn't that drenched in irony? Man, did like just how much this all stands up still. It's crazy. Yeah, dude, it's wild. It's almost as if like political change hasn't happened in like, I don't know, 30 years. It, <laughs> it, it's almost as if we, if we don't teach people about history, then it's bound to fucking repeat itself yeah it uh it does that from time to time doesn't it yeah fucking yeah man this what? album very very political but way deeper like this album is not telling you about the teachers that told you to fight me this one is just on some shit <laughs> like way way darker themes as well you know it all kind of ties in to you like you know anti-colonialist anti imperialistic kind of politics but you know it's a little bit on the heavier side of things did you know that they covered uh fuck the police on this i actually kind of forgot about that honestly was that a yeah bonus track? Well, te technically not on it it was done or it was released later as a uh, as a b-side to a single uh okay i actually didn't hear that is it any good I mean, it's Rage Against Machine covering Fuck the Police. So it's pretty sick. Probably their best era. So, yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah, there there is a live version out that you can find, but the uh, the OG version is is very hard to find because it was kind of just given out to uh, their the band's fan club at the time. Because mm. remember when bands had like actual fan clubs? Oh, they had like really shitty websites. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I do. He, yeah, if that even sometimes. No, I actually don't remember that very well, but yeah. Okay, I remember that and being a thing. I don't remember signing up to any of them, however. Yeah, obviously, like, yeah, Kiss Army and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, did you, uh, do you like this album more than the self-titled? No. What do you no, think? No, I don't. I, I like the self-titled more. Uh, I, j I just think... There's a lot more in the self-title that I can get behind and get into. Just like the vibe a little bit different or a little bit more? Yeah. Yeah. I I think I do like the fact that it is more rock than it is rap. You know what? Here's the real difference between these two albums. That Rage Against the Machine self-titled, that's a good beer drinking album. The uh, second album, Evil Empire, that's a weed smoking album. Well, that would explain why I like the first album more. You get high on marijuana, you listen to this thing, and you're riding the bus. Yeah, dude, you're, you're fucking in the zone. I am speaking anecdotally, of course. <laughs> anecdotally. How about uh, Battle of Los Angeles? I uh, have very unfortunate feelings about this album. <laughs> unfortunate feelings. Okay. Yeah, mostly that I think it's pretty hit and miss. Little more on the hit side. But there's a couple clunkers on here that I uh, wish weren't on this album. I think this album has some really, really like high points. But man, some of these songs I just want to end. Yeah, I I don't think anything on here is particularly bad. It just doesn't quite hit the same way in a lot of places. And you do it does kind of lose the. It, it it kind of falls off the rails a little bit when that happens. It's front loaded, for sure. Yeah. I yeah, think uh, all the good shit's on the front. But one thing I did like about this album, this is a really good third album in the sense that, like, it takes a lot of elements from the first one, a lot of elements from the second one, and it just tries to find a happy medium. Um, in the case of this particular set list, I actually prefer their riffage songs more than, like, the DJ kind of stuff. Yeah. I think yeah, me too. the riffs on here on songs like Gorilla Radio and Testify – you know, Sleep Now and the Fire are really sick, right? But then on the other hand, you also have songs like Maria and Voice of the Voiceless, which are basically just, like, way more on the hip-hop side. And I think all of it's good. I just, you know, Born of a Broken Man doesn't always do it for me. 
new millennium homes i'm like eh, I, I always forget it's kind of on there until it comes on ashes in the fall it's fine it's, it's just not like front to back straight bangers and as a result yeah. it just makes me want to like stop listening to that one and then put on like one or two yeah but the first yeah, half is really fun but you know yeah it does definitely up. fall off um sleep down on the fire and testify do you know who directed the music video Ooh, is it someone controversial? It was Michael Moore. That's actually kind of cool. It makes a lot of sense, but yeah. <laughs> I was hoping you were going to say someone like, oh, who was the fucker who did um, the Twilight Zone movie and a bunch of people died? I couldn't tell you. Oh, dude, you definitely know his stuff. He did the Michael Jackson thriller video. Oh, that's going to bug me. Anyways, yeah, that's not the point. I was hoping you were going to say him. John Landis. Uh, so enough. we're gonna say John Landis. It wasn't John Landis. Okay. It wasn't John Landis. No, All Michael right. Moore, the bowling for Columbine guy. That's uh that's actually very fitting, honestly. Yeah. You know, it doesn't surprise me that they have like one degree of separation from each other. Yeah. And cool. uh and it was also it debuted number one on the billboard and beat Mariah Carey. That's pretty cool. Which is always funny. Won a Grammy, that's pretty cool. Yeah. I mean, this album's good. It's just like... It, it, it is kind of, very front-loaded. It just kind of falls off for me a little bit, and like everything that happens on this album has just been done before. And eh, you know, it's whatever. Yeah. Um, give some thoughts on the the last album, Renegades, and I will be back in two seconds. I just, just need to check something real quick. Yeah, sure, sure. Here's the thing about Renegades, guys. Not good. <laughs> I really want to like Renegades. And when I agreed to do this episode, I was like, oh, man, I'm listening to Renegades in fucking eons. And I remember people telling me that they thought this album sucked. I don't know if I think it sucks, but my God, this thing falls off for me so hard, man. And there are some really, really, really sick tracks on here. Like, I really like, you know, Pistol Grip Pump and, like, Renegades Funk is really cool, how I could just kill a man, and, like, Maggie's Farm, but, like, what I found when I was listening to this thing, it just keeps going. Just keeps yeah. going, man. I, <laughs> I, I really thought it was eventually going to end, and it just never did. I had a long drive that day, so I put this thing on, and the first half, I was, like, fucking sold on it, man. I was, like, nodding along, and I was like, yeah, this is good. Like, I'm really, really vibing with this now, and then it just kept going, man. And then Maggie's Farm came on. I was like, okay, like there's a payoff because that song is fucking sick. But I mean, in fairness, um, it like it is an album of covers. Mm -hmm. So that that is the interesting part that obviously most people don't really realize is it is all covers the whole way through. But not maybe the most obvious kinds definitely, of covers. No, definitely not the most obvious. They don't just um, like, really play their riffs, with the exception of the, I think, um, Down on the Street's a little bit more of a straight-up cover. Yeah, Ghost of Tom Joad is a little bit, uh, like, you you can tell it's a cover, or, like, if you know the original, you can tell what song it is, but, uh, yeah, it, they do still kind of make it their own. Yeah, they actually, straight up, dude, I actually don't know the, uh, the actual original versions of any of these songs. Um, all of the rap songs they kind of cover on here are actually kind of like not really in my taste of hip-hop like don't get me wrong man like I, i'm okay with cypress hills you know not not really for me like for example and yeah yeah it's always the one that people bring up is cypress hill i've never just i i've never gotten the whole fucking love for him and uh you know volume 10 he does the original version of pistol grip pump and volume 10 yeah. is not a rapper that's particularly relevant Still making music, I just checked. Wow. But um, not a very, very successful rapper. So that's kind of more of a deep cut, quite honestly. Really good song, you know. Yeah. You know, uh, the first track, Microphone Fiend, is done by Eric B. and Rakim. And if you aren't a hip-hop fan, this is just, like, fucking Greek. <laughs> like, yeah. if you don't know what hip-hop is, this isn't going to win you over, I don't think. This is, this is for the rap fans, which I actually think is a really cool concept for an album. I just wish it was better. I respect yeah. this album a lot more than um, 
the Battle for Los Angeles, quite honestly. Like, Battle of Los Angeles is definitely a better album, like, by quite a bit. I do, however, think that this album is incredibly ambitious. Like, it's a cover album that's very sneaky as a cover album. Like, Yeah, I don't think most people realize that it's a cover album. You wouldn't unless you're into some shit. And here's the thing. Do you, do you remember BT Bam put out a color or pff, cover album? No, did they? They did, actually. I think it's called The Anatomy Of, if I'm remembering the name correctly. Check it out, dude. I don't know if you're a BT Bam guy, but that's how I think a bad cover album is done. Not because the album sucks, but because it's literally BT Bam playing these songs. Like, essentially verbatim. That was, well, not early, early, but that was early-ish. It's yeah, four I colors, mean, yeah. It's it's a bit of a weird one. Um, in, in fairness, like, I don't... I'm sure we'll talk about BT Bam at some point, but yeah, yeah. they're very uh, iffy to me. And I've like I've seen yeah. them; oh, they're, too, they're yeah. great live. Yeah, but... I, I have feelings about them as well. Yeah, um, generally more positive than negative, but you know that's besides the I'm point. Sure. That's an episode sure. for we'll another day. Yeah, yeah, we exactly. have to. I think it's essential. Essential but, contemporary yeah. metal listening. Anyways, um, yeah, I I do have mixed feelings about this album i'm generally leaning towards it not being particularly good but if you ask me why is this album kind of boring i i can't tell you why you you know what is nice yeah unlike every other fucking band in the world they decide not to cover depeche mode oh thank god (laughs) that should be like a legal decree no like banter. Joe Biden should cover just, the touch mode anymore. Joe Biden should just come out there and be like, "Enough of the malarkey. Stop covering fucking Dimpesh mode." Also, what's the what other one that band? everyone covers? That other new wave band. Um, everyone wants to rule the world. Oh, um, that's another cover that we should ban. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we should do more Anyways. minor threat covers. <laughs> Yeah, Could I forgot be. about that track on here. That minor threat cover is kind of kind of weak. It's just literally them playing like a hardcore song, but like it doesn't feel very hardcore. It's just I don't know. There's only one song in this album they still play live. Probably Renegades of Funk. Nope. Maggie's Farm. Nope. Pistol Grip Pump. Nope. How I Could Just Kill a Man. Nope. Who is it? Keep going. Let's see. Let's see if you can figure it out. Kick out the jams. <laughs> nope. Street fighting man. Nope. Microphone fiend. Nope. I'm Housen. No. Beautiful world. No. That's a Devo cover. Ew. Down on the street. No. <laughs> the ghost of Tom Jode. There you go. Wow. That's a weird one to bust out at a concert. Yeah, that's the one they always play. I don't even remember that track very well. i got to go back to it. <laughs> but, yeah. Is it your favorite um, song on yeah, the album? Yeah, no. I, 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 honestly, like, very little of this stuck with me. The entire way through, very little of this stuck with me. It was just, it was just such a meh batch of covers, in my opinion. But they're all good, and that's the weirdest part about it. Why doesn't this album work? I can't dissect it. It's like, because yeah. they're all competently done, obviously. They all sound good. They're all produced well. It's just, for some reason, it just doesn't land. Yeah. It's complicated, really. It really is. You know what's really complicated about this band is, like, this is this band's career, essentially. We basically covered all of Rage Against the Machine. You can probably see why they fell off and broke up yeah i mean it does just become a lot doesn't it could you imagine like what this band would even be like if they continued would they just turn into like a seven string band i mean we'll figure out soon because are they making they're new back music? probably i hope not well do you, do you really think that they could do you really think that they are a band who could continue to tour off of the same songs that they've or they already have Every 80s thrash metal band has done that. 
But every 80s thrash metal band has tried to release new stuff and usually end up with one or two songs that stick. But then Razor didn't release anything for almost 30 years, and they toured for years without new music. Exciter <laughs> doesn't release new music, Wait, do they? Razor ha- has been playing new songs, though. Because oh, okay. uh, yeah, the, yeah. the album that's coming out this year, ironically, I have a shirt for from 2017. Really? And that's when it was supposed to come out. What the fuck? I didn't know about that. That's crazy, dude. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I genuinely have a shirt from Razor that says, uh, was it Cycles of Contempt, has the album art, and, says, and on the back says Summer 2017. That is so amazing. Holy and, crap, and- dude. They, they released that, or they sold that shirt when I saw them as a quote-unquote promise to release the album that year. Um, spoiler alert for those who weren't there five years ago, it didn't happen. Yeah. Obviously, like, there's a lot of stuff that went on behind the scenes. Of course, yeah, yeah, it's not as... Con- they didn't yeah. just, like, <laughs> fuck off. Like, they were very but, active as a band. But they didn't tell anyone the stuff that was happening behind the scenes. Of course, yeah. So, to a lot of people, it really does seem like they just fucked off and decided not to do shit. Yeah. Uh, Prophets of Rage. I don't know if I'm done talking about Rage Against the Machine. Do we know why this band broke up? I don't know. Do you know? No, I was just hoping you'd have an answer ready to go. Uh, Because, I don't know. Zach was done. Um, I could see that being a thing. I feel like that was it, because obviously when Prophet started, he was the only one who... Like, the Prophet started out of the fact that they wanted to do... They wanted to come back, and he wasn't. He didn't want to be part of it. Well, Zach the Rhodes um, did leave the band in 2000, and he cites, I feel that now it was necessary to leave Rage, because our decision-making process has completely failed. It is no longer meeting the aspirations of our of all four of us collectively as a band, and from my perspective, has undermined our artistic and political ideals. So I just got sick of it, just felt it wasn't working. Yeah. And Can we just I, talk about the fact that they, this is, like, this tour, tour that they're doing now is their second reunion? I actually didn't know about the first one. Yeah, 2007. How come I don't remember that? I know I was, like, a child, but, like, I don't know. I feel like they probably only did festivals. Yeah. Yeah, they played Coachella. I see. Oh, yeah. I forgot about this. I mean, forgot, quote unquote. Um, The UK decided to do a whole thing in 2009 where they tried, where they wanted to make Killing the Name of the number one song for Christmas. Weird. And it actually worked. It was it, Killing in the Name was the number one song on the UK singles charts on Christmas. That's actually pretty cool. Very Christmassy song. Yep. And then they did like they did a couple of shows at that that time in Europe, and then yeah, they fucked off again. Brilliant stuff. And the Prophets of Rage. Prophets of Rage, this album fucking sucks, dude. It's, here's the thing, is it's like, it's kind of just like Renegades, where it's like, I don't feel like this should suck, though. No, I feel like this, I I actually have way more to say about it than that. Oh, yeah. I think Renegades should have technically ruled. Because in theory... It, it sounds like a great idea. Like, oh, they're going to explore more of their hip-hop side, play all these, like, covers. It's going to sound like Rage. It's going to be pretty hype. And here's the thing. Is uh, Chuck B and... Sorry, Chuck D and B Real. They don't have bars on bars on bars. And this album literally sounds like a dad rap rock album. It sounds so boomer. I wanted to fucking cry when I heard this album. It sucks so hard, dude. Okay, okay. You know what song made me say fuck this album? Legalize me. <laughs> that song reeks, dude. It is not cool. They have like this like vocal effect on it. I forget whose vocal line it is where it's like, legalize me. And I'm just like, oh my god, this is so cringe. Why do they do this, man? Yeah, it's it. 
certainly was not a good choice. I was to uh, fucking yeah, none stupid, of this, dude. Yeah, none of this was was great at all. Not uh, <laughs> not a single part of it. Yeah. No. I don't really understand what was going on at this time. Um, like I said, theoretically, it, it on paper, there's no reason that this shouldn't have worked. I, but, I have more thoughts. But it just it just didn't. And obviously, a big part of Rage is everything was written by Zach. And obviously, Zach had the most to say. Zach like has done all sorts of research into everything that he wrote about. But, uh, yeah. Yikes. As it would turn Anyways. out... Chuck D and Be Real don't have bars. I uh, I think as a society we have to retcon this idea that Public Enemy is in some way classic. We should just do away with that idea. I am so embarrassed by their performances on this album. It's not good. Not good. And by that standard, Cypress Hill should be treated the same way. Yeah, Cypress Hill's weird. Cypress Hill's way cooler than Public Enemy, though, honestly. Yeah. I, yeah, dude, I, I'm not going to die on that hill, but, like, <laughs> holy fuck, dude. This album's got nothing to say, either. A lot of the political message on this album is very much like, oh, you know, stand up to abuse. Like, here's the thing. is, uh, Be real, this isn't his first, like, rap, rock, rap metal band. Mm. Like, he he tried one before, and it died very quickly. It it should have been pretty obvious how this was gonna go, like that that was literally them trying to survive off of playing old Rage Against the Machine songs and releasing an album because they probably just kind of felt like they needed to. Well, you see, that's actually would have been way more cool. Is like if they had just said, "Yeah, we're gonna like tour Rage Against the Machine stuff and have more of a party thing." Like, I get it. I think what this why they released it is honestly just because they're friends. I think it, realistically they got this band together. They probably were just jamming rage songs and one point ago like, oh, we should make an album. We sound pretty cool and they started writing but because everyone liked each other, they didn't they didn't want to like criticize each other's work cuz I I unless everyone just has bad taste. <laughs> like I I I would believe that like for them, this album must have been so fun to make that they probably thought, like, man, everyone's going to love this. But it blinded them to, like, just how mid it is. Like, well, okay, so when Prophets of Rage came together, they were always supposed to have their own music. Yeah. But it was only really meant to be a couple songs to bring back, you know, the love for Rage Against Machine. And uh, it obviously just... Like, they signed a record deal. And uh, if I had to guess, the record company was like, no, we want a full album. Yeah. And then they just kind of did that. Yeah. Yeah. Classic case of just because you you could doesn't mean you should. But, I mean, this album really did bring back a love for Rage Against the Machine because after you heard this album, you said, damn... I could go over some reaching as the machine right now. I need a palate cleanser. Yeah. I mean, Unfuck the World was directed by Michael Moore. So he came yeah. back. Yeah, good for him. <laughs> Woo. Speaking of people who used to be cool, Michael Moore fell off a little bit. Um, uh, I don't know. I don't mind his movies. Just, you know, some of his newer stuff just isn't as cool. I don't know. What was that rap rock band that Chuck D was in before this? I never heard uh, about this. They were called Cut. Uh, no, not Chuck B. Be real. Be real. Was oh, it's Be real. Sorry, rock. my bad. My yeah. bad. He's in a band called Kush. K U S H. K U S H. So that's a marijuana reference. <laughs> really, with the guy who has. It's pretty much always photographed with a weed leaf on his shirt, and it's called Dr. Green Thumb. You think he's into marijuana? I think he might be into a little bit of marijuana. I mean, okay, quick aside. Yeah. This this, Kush, right, (laughs) was B-Real, 
Deftones guitarist Stephen Carpenter and former Fear Factory members Raymond Herrera and Christian Wolbers. <laughs> what the fuck? Wasn't he good? They lasted two years and didn't release any albums. They didn't release anything. Oh my god. So, oh, boy. they didn't even get signed. Dude. <laughs> no, that sucks. Yeah. 2014, in a Reddit AMA, Be Real indicated the project was stalled by record labels fighting. You know what the fight was? Damn, they brother, this album them. sucks. <laughs> We probably shouldn't no, spend money no, on it. No, no, no. Metal Blade, it's okay. You you can sign them. It's fine. It's fine, Metal Blade. You can sign. I swear. I no, swear. no, no, no. Napalm okay. Records, you would love to sign this record. <laughs> I, oh, feel like, I feel like if they were to have been popular in the mid-2010s, um, Prosthetic Records would have signed them in a heartbeat. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> For real. Yeah, dude. Um, yeah, Prophets of Rage fucking sucks. Yeah. <laughs> I hate this album. You know, dude, yeah. I remember the moment I listened to this album. When I hit Legalize Me, I was like, wow, this is really, really bad. And then it kept going, and I was like, this is just a bummer. Do you have an EP called The Party's Over? I didn't listen to it. I don't care. Fuck this album. <laughs> Fuck this band. Hey, uh, I already wasn't into Rage Against the Machine like prior to going back and actually listening to it. Yeah, but uh, Unfuck the World came out, and I was like, Ah, oh, yes, I still fucking don't like Rage Against the Machine. And then <laughs> went on with my life as as if that was that. Yeah, and yeah, no, Prophet of Rage is not not good. Um, I understand why people went to see it because they played like Unfuck the World and maybe one other song, and then. Continued on with being a Rage Against the Machine cover man. I almost saw them. Did you? Yeah, in like 2017 when this album came out, because I didn't know really what they were about. I was like, oh man, that sounds kind of fun. I could I could go see like half of Cypress Hill and, you know, Rage Let's Against see. the Machine. Yeah, why not? Fuck it. So, their last the last show that they played, they did... Prophets of Rage, the Public Enemy song. Testify, Unfuck the World, Gorilla Radio, Made with Hate, which is another Prophet song. Know Your Enemy, Hail to the Chief, Heart of Fire, both Prophet songs. Take the Power Back. Mm -hmm. uh, a medley of songs that I don't recognize. So, Sleep Now in the Fire. They did an Audio Slave cover, but only the instrumentals, thank God. A weird choice. I mean, thank God they didn't decide to try and sing "Audio Slave." That would have been pretty. Actually, I kind of regret that they didn't do that. Uh, "Bull in the Head," "Living on the One Ten," which is a prophet song. "How I Could Just Kill a Man," which is obviously, yeah. like we said already, Cypress Hill song. "Bulls on Parade," "Fight the Power," "Public Enemy," uh, "Killing in the Name," then "Bomb Track." So, Not a bad yeah. set list. No, like that's what I mean. Is like they kind of just threw in a couple prophet songs and then lived off of rage. <laughs> and even like Cypress Hill, really, like you know. Yeah, I mean, like I recognize a couple songs in this medley thing that they did. It seems like they just kind of put together like a bunch of rap songs, mm -hmm. just to kind of indicate that, like, hey man, we're rap. Yeah. And gang. All right, then. Well, uh, I really hope to God that band never comes back. I think it's safe to say they're probably pretty done. Yeah. Yeah, they're definitely done. <laughs> Rage is back. Rage is doing their own thing. And uh, I'm sure Rage will release music at some point, and it will be commercially panned by people and but it will still do very well yeah i would be very very surprised how they progress if they do it all if they turn into a gent band i would probably really like that i think it'd be funny 
because all heavy music eventually turns into a form of gents, whether we want it to or not. So, yep. Every band yep. that's old enough eventually just gets seven string guitars. Official petition to have the periphery guitarist just join them. That'd be so fucking hilarious. So like, yeah, Misha Mansoor is our other guitar player. Fuck it. Luke Holland on drums. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> well, anyways. Well, we're, not, we're not firing members. We're just adding new ones. Oh, yeah. So you have two drummers. Who cares? Hey, I guys. also, by the yeah. way, Prophets of Rage also broke up. So there you go. Thank yeah. God. Thank God. And now Rage uh, Against Machine are back and they cost a lot of money to go see. Yeah. But they're against capitalism. Rage Against the Machine. Anyways. Amazing band. God bless them. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, if you haven't listened to them yet, then you probably should because I don't know how you've avoided it this long, but they are arguably an essential listen Yeah. in that capacity. But, yeah. Anyways, thanks for listening. And have... find us on socials because you can see cool pictures that Marcus takes and sometimes I take. Like Marcus's new pictures that he will be putting out. I will be putting or, out for or, at the gates. Or has, or has put out for oh, at the God. gates and, and municipal waste. Hey, should we talk about municipal waste at some point? Yeah, that's a good idea. Okay. I don't I, know when um, we'll do that, but... We have a Patreon. Yeah, we do. We have <laughs> Facebook. We have YouTube. My God. Like and subscribe. Yeah, Please. definitely definitely pop on the YouTube. Lots yeah. of stuff on the YouTube. Lots of stuff. A lot of interviews. A lot of interviews. I, I, I was busy for a while, and then yeah. I wasn't. Then you because was. life. Life is and, interesting. And now I'm back, and I will potentially be busy again. All right, then. Yeah. Thank you for listening, and adios. Bye.